Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. I'm Fred Martino. This week we begin with a look back at the legislative work completed last year and a look ahead to the next meeting of the Illinois General Assembly. I am very pleased to welcome Senator Terry Bryant of Illinois Senate District 58. Senator, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Fred, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a little while since I've been on WSIU uh, TV, so uh, thank you for having me. Well, it is great to have you with us, and I, I want to start with uh, kind of a big question, but just I, I do this very often to try to get uh, reflections on 2023, your thoughts on the biggest accomplishment, accomplishments of the year. Uh, well, so I, I think there are several. Um, on a personal note, first of all, this is my first uh, time as serving in leadership. So uh, this past year, I was appointed as the assistant minority leader. I think that's good for the 58th Senate District because it gives us a louder voice. Uh, quite often, leaders are uh, approached more often, and there's a little bit more weight uh, to the things that they say. So I think that's good for we in Southern Illinois. Uh, uh, so on a personal note, that uh, was true. Uh, you know that my wheelhouse, if you will, or my history has been the Illinois Department of Corrections. And so uh, I would say uh, really over the last three years, but in particular this past year, we saw a real change with the Prison Review Board. Uh, Senator McClure, Senator Plummer and I uh, served uh, on the Executive Appointments Committee and uh, multiple times we saw real problems at the Prison Review Board. One being that it was a 14 member board and at one time, I think there were only five people appointed to that board. And so it was almost impossible for them to function. Uh, at one time, there were multiple members that we, we were hoping were not going to get confirmed. In one case, there was an appointee uh, who, uh, had, was actually, who actually was voting to release someone from prison while that prison review board member had served time in that same prison. Mm. So you can see that there were, uh, there, and there were a multitude prob of problems beyond that. I serve in a super duper minority. And so quite often um, we're confronted with the fact that we don't have the votes to do some of the things that we would like to do. But what we do have is a really strong voice. And so because of that, and, um, and I was uh, in the forefront of this particular issue with the Prison Review Board, we were able to uh, keep three individuals from being confirmed. That's nearly impossible for a minority party. We also were able to get the governor to make better appointments to the board. And I think we've seen a move in, the, uh, in, in a direction that is certainly more victim uh, related uh, rather than being um, what I would term very soft on crime, very soft on criminals, and taking a little bit harder look at victims. So I'm super proud of that. All right. Well, tell us about some of the most important issues that you're still working on for 2024. Uh, I, so we were just asked, actually, we Republicans were just asked to give a priority list to the Democrat leadership. And so it's pretty easy to, because I've already thought this through a lot. I have um, one particular bill that has not been filed yet, uh, so I don't have a bill number for it. But the genesis of this bill actually started in the House. I was not aware of it. It's it's called Faith's Bill. Um, Senator, or, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Amy Ellick has been working with a victim uh, in the house. It has to do with 18 year olds who are still in high school, who are um, have sexual relations with a teacher or a school employee. Presently, if, a, if someone is seven, like 17 or under and that happens, there is actually a felony charge. But if this student is 18 or older, the, the school employee might be fired, but there's actually no ability to charge that individual with a crime. Amy Ellick, uh, Representative Ellick has been working on that in the House. It was brought to my attention by uh, uh, an educator in Benton, but also I have what's called the Youth Advisory Council. So it's high schoolers from all over the district. I meet with twice a year. 
they um, determine during our Youth Advisory Council what issue is most important to them. They, we split them up in five different groups, then they debate with each other and they choose one bill that they would like to see me carry in the next cycle. This is the bill. Mm. And so it is my intention to have a bill that uh, mirrors, uh, right now, if you work in the Department of Corrections, Department of Human Services, if you're a doctor, if you're an attorney, you cannot have sexual relations with those who you have custodial care or responsibility over. I don't care if a student is 18, 19, or 20 years old, they're still students. And that educator has the ability to lower grades, to create uh, disciplinary issues, and that can have an effect on scholarship money, on all kinds of things in that person's future. I think it warrants a, a felony charge. And so I'm gonna be working with the House members who are already running this in conjunction with victims and in conjunction with my Youth Advisory Council. That's my number one priority for this next year. Okay, very interesting and uh, interesting to hear that that was something that uh, students identified as a priority that you work with. As you know, Senator, uh, there is a lot of concern about the increasing cost of care for asylum seekers in Chicago. What would you like to see in regard to this? Well, I think the first thing that has to happen because um, immigration is a federal issue. And that being said, I think we saw um, very good results regardless of where an individual is in, uh, on the issue of President Trump. The Remain in Mexico policy worked in order to curb uh, the, uh, uh, the crossings at the border. Uh, as WSIU, you know that there is a huge number of immigrants in the Carbondale area that are Pakistani and Indian and many other cultures, many other nationalities who are waiting in line for 30, 50, I even heard 90 years one time for someone to get a green card because of our, our uh, federal policies. So it isn't just a matter of those who are coming across the border, the Southern border or even the Northern border for that fact. It's a, it's a terrible federal policy that we are um, having in place right now. So first thing to do would be to close the border in a way that allows us to sort out the claims of asylum seekers first. But what has happened in Illinois um, with the policies that we have here in Illinois is we have out a welcome mat all over the world that says, come to Illinois, because here they can actually get free medical care, just as an example. Um, for instance, if you are a, a naturalized citizen of Illinois, which one of my best friends is a Nicaraguan naturalized citizen now. She, if she, if she needed to get Medicaid in Illinois, she would fall under um, a managed care system. So your doctor has to be pre-approved, hospital pre-approved, and your procedure pre-approved. But right now, asylum seekers fall under a different method, right? So those Medicaid recipients are under fee for service. No pre-approval for the doctor, no pre-approval for the hospital, 100% paid for, and that is for ages 42 and above. And it's also for those who fall under all kids. And so right now, regardless of what's happening at the border or who is being shipped to Illinois from another state, the welcome mat is open. I mean, it's, it's out there. The welcome mat is out and the come to Illinois sign is up. And we're gonna see a, a real problem with our budget in fiscal 2024. And that policy is a big part of what we're gonna see as a problem with our budget. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, certainly uh, the other issue is the hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, care for asylum seekers. Some have asked uh, around the country, not just uh, in the Chicago mayor, but in Denver, in New York City, have asked the federal government to step up to spend more uh, for these expenses. Uh, are you, in your view, looking at this, are you seeing enough action to get that done? 
Well, so again, because it's the federal government's responsibility to maintain the border, it, it is their responsibility to fund those needs. But to play devil's advocate here in this, it's still taxpayer money. So whether you take it out of the left pocket or the right pocket, it's still taxpayer money. And okay. so the problem has to be addressed. And there are some issues that you can't just keep throwing money at. And this okay. is one of those. You know, in, in regard to, to budget and money issue, you said hundreds of millions. But in fiscal 2023, uh, Illinois budget had, I think it was $250 million budgeted for this program. We spent over 900 million. And in fiscal 2024, uh, the Pritzker administration acknowledged that 250 million wasn't enough. So in this year's budget, there's just over 500 million just in that Medicaid issue. But we're anticipating, we were anticipating 1.1 billion. Now we're thinking that it might be as much as $2 billion in spending. So while we had a so-called $200 million surplus in this year's budget, if you have a $1.5 billion hole, there's no surplus. You got to find that money somewhere. The governor's already went in and, and taken money away from DCFS to throw at this problem. DCFS, for God's sake, of all the places to, you know, to, to sweep money from, that's a place not to sweep it from. So this is going to be an ongoing issue. Absolutely. And certainly on a previous uh, episode of this program, we also noted that the city of Chicago now is using uh, money that was allocated uh, for COVID relief uh, to deal with care for asylum seekers. You've already noted that in the next fiscal year, there is projected to be a massive budget deficit, hundreds of millions of dollars, in addition to the asylum issue and the ongoing medical care issue, which is separate. Uh, what else do you think should be done in the next session of the General Assembly to deal with this budget deficit? Um, well, first, let me give you one more deficit issue that we're gonna have, and then I think I can address both of those possibly. We think that we might have as much as a $200 million deficit in school funding. And that is because as the asylum seekers uh, come into Illinois, they have, to be, they have to be allowed to be in schools. They're allowed to be in schools. So our local school districts are gonna be footing the bill for that. And you know where the money comes from for that, it's in property taxes. So I think not only are we talking about an issue with the state budget, but we're also talking about what are these, uh, I, I represent more than 50 school districts in the 58th Senate district, uh, public school districts. Where's that money going to come from? Because they don't have it now. And it's only going to, it seems that it's only going to get worse as we move forward. So um, to address the issues, I'm not somebody who believes that we should be throwing money at things. Number one is you, uh, Governor Pritzker said that on the issue of asylum seekers, that he was going to come back to the committee known as JCAR, which is the committee that makes rules. Whenever we pass laws, each agency has to come up with rules for how that will be implemented, and they have to go to JCAR to get approval for those rules or to get emergency rules approved. The governor said that he was going to go to JCAR, and he was going to actually implement uh, this managed care aspect rather than fee for service. And he was also going to put um, uh, um, some means testing in there. So how much money is this person making uh, so that there would be like a copay, for instance, uh, that hasn't happened. And so first, I think Governor Pritzker has to do the things that he promised the legislature and those who voted for the budget, he promised them that he was going to do because he hasn't done that yet. So I would say, let's start with that. Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. We are speaking this week with Senator Terry Bryant. She is from Illinois Senate District 58. 
Senator, we're going to begin this portion of our uh, conversation today with an issue that uh, has been discussed for quite some time. Republicans have been calling for state ethics reforms. What would you like to see in this regard? Um, so we had a we had a package of bills that addressed this. Um, those bills uh, were never called. Um, in fact, I think I might have jotted down a couple bill numbers, but um, uh, Senate Bill 4013 and Senate Bill 4012 um, were a part of that package. Um, they dealt mostly with the ability to lobby after you get out of office. Uh, I, I think really, I, I am not one of those individuals who thinks all lobbyists are terrible. I personally think that there are a lot of really good lobbyists who are experts on issues. I'm the minority spokesperson for energy. And, you know, I told you my wheelhouse is Department of Corrections. So coming into energy, I had to find some lobbyists that know a lot more about energy than I do uh, to, to kind of check me out on some things, right? Um, but we have, we've tried to address the revolving door issue, but right now, the revolving door issue, even with some changes, is so weak that you could uh, be a lobbyist six months after leaving office. And it really should be a minimum of one year, because quite often, if you are uh, allowed to become a lobbyist six months after you've left office, you're still seeing uh, bills that either you filed or someone that you're very close to has filed. And so I think, first of all, We've got to fix that revolving door that has to do uh, with lobbyists. And then um, actually the bill numbers that I gave you, I think had to do with the RICO Act, but we had some on the revolving door issue. You know, everyone's familiar with the federal RICO Act, but we also have a state version of that RICO Act. And the two bill numbers that I gave you, uh, 4013 and 4012, address the ability for state's attorneys uh, and grand juries uh, to be able to um, investigate and indict on RICO. So if there is a, a legislator or a government official who is engaged in bribery um, or in any of the things that we've seen in recent years, uh, right now you have to wait for the feds to do wiretaps to actually indict that person I don't think that we should have to wait for the federal government to step in. It's a national embarrassment for us that we have to wait for the feds to step in. We should have that ability statewide. And I'm going to back up just a little bit, because if you think about the fact that um, when, when Speaker Madigan was in place and his daughter, Lisa, was the attorney general, you actually had a, a father-daughter situation where the attorney general would have had to indict her own father where we should be able to have the ability to convene a grand jury or for state's attorneys to engage in that. And I think that does away with a lot of what we've seen uh, as far as ethics violations go. Okay, I wanna move on to uh, another issue very important in your uh, district with Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Higher education received a major funding increase this year. What are your thoughts about that increase and how that money is being spent? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I am a member of um, the Higher Education Working Group, bipartisan, bicameral. They've accomplished a lot of really good things, um, such as uh, something called the AIM High program. So that is for students who go to Illinois high schools and go to Illinois public universities and colleges. Uh, we're finally seeing some uh, hi uh, higher ed entities really start to have buy-in with the AIM High, and that's keeping students here in Illinois. So it's taken a couple of years for that really to take off and for some of the universities to, to really get engaged. SIU has, from the beginning, has tried to engage with AIM High, and they're doing a super good job of making that possible for individuals. So um, I think the higher ed working group, uh, because it's bipartisan and bicameral, I think we're gonna see some movement maybe on a funding formula for universities that would be really similar to what we have for uh, pre-K through 12. Like to see that happen. I think that gives benchmarks for where a college or university uh, has to reach in order to get better funding. 
Um, we did have an increase in the funding. Some of it was MAP grant. That's all good stuff. But um, as somebody who's very blue collar and uh, worked really hard all my life, I know that sometimes those who are in the support staff are the ones who get left behind. I would really like to see us use the money first to make sure that we keep good students here in Illinois. We draw those students back from other states, but that support staff, they took pay freezes or really minimal raises while administrators um, were getting raises in the past, maybe not as much as they would like to get, uh, but a lot of the support staff really got kicked to the curb. So I'd like to see some of those dollars used um, for support staff. Uh, I think that's a good use of money because that support staff is what keeps the wheels of higher education work functioning. And we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we get good um, professors, uh, good, um, uh, good instructors, but sometimes we leave that support staff and they, they never catch up because you always get percentage raises. So it seems like they never catch up. I hope that our uh, public universities and colleges remember that those folks really bit the uh, really bit the bullet for many years, and and now okay. they make it up. Yeah. Just a few minutes left, and uh, I don't want to run out of time without asking hopefully two more questions. One, as you know, last year there was some success in getting licensing reforms for certain professions. What else, if anything, would you like to see? Uh, well, we so we have to have better reciprocity. Um, between uh, ourselves and other states. Uh, I understand that some states have different laws in regard, to, especially where medical is concerned. The two mm -hmm. biggest areas that we have problems are in medical and in education. So um, if, you're a if you're a teacher in, in Illinois, a lot of Illinois teachers went to Missouri. They went because Missouri has better laws for reciprocity. Their um, pensions are uh, it's it, it better than ours are. You have to work longer here uh, to get that pension. But reciprocity is hard. So if you are a Missouri teacher or an Indiana teacher or a Kentucky teacher or Wisconsin, you name the state, it's difficult to come to Illinois. One, because our laws on reciprocity are very strict. Two is because um, IDFPR or our regulating agency, they're slow. I mean, super slow, like to the point that if you have, say, a, a physical therapist who is could be licensed in multiple states and has a job here waiting in Illinois, but it can take three months, six months, nine months to get them licensed. Uh, and by that, you know, the hospital is waiting for them. They're waiting. They can't wait for a job. For yeah. Six and I know months. that's. I, I know that's an issue for nurses as well. Oh, that the nurses that's... who moved to Illinois. The, the Illinois does not participate in the compact that most states participate in. So you can't get your Illinois uh, license with reciprocity as you described for teachers yes. either. That's so I right. know there's, and, there's yeah, been work on trying to change that, but it has never gone anywhere. Um, so the, the nurse compact, we've made some, uh, we made really some strides with that. I think yeah. we'll do more of the reciprocity issue, but IDFPR, that, that agency, um, the legislature continues to pile on things that people have to be licensed for. We have a, 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 a load of, uh, of um, uh, requirements in Illinois that other states don't have. We haven't always given our agencies the money. And again, I don't just want to throw money at agencies, but they have to have the ability to have good com good good uh, computer access, I mean, good grief. When I came into the legislature in 2014, we had agencies still using DOS, right? So it's it's crazy, the computer systems that we're making them use. And so I think if we're gonna have money that is given to agencies, IDFPR is one that we need to bring them into this century. Okay, time for one more question. Uh, and it is related to licensing. What else do you think Illinois needs to do to attract and retain jobs in the state? Just, so jobs right now, just getting employees is a national problem right now. And I just heard a, a really good presentation recently of a national speaker who, said, who talked about this being a national problem. One is because we're all getting older 
and and so we have a generational issue with that. Um, so we're going to have to be making some transitions to the fact that we might not get the same personal service that we have become accustomed to. I'm 60. I don't mind saying that because I don't get my senior discount. Um, but <laughs> we might not be able to have all of those things that we've become accustomed to having. So we might have a little more self-service kind of things. Uh, but to make Illinois a more business-friendly state, good grief, we have to get rid of some of the rules that we have for businesses. I know everybody thinks minimum wage increase is awesome for people, but it's not awesome for businesses. And it is killing them. And it's causing an increase in our inflation, all of those kind of things. But I think more than anything, when we're talking about this question, it's economic development. And we have piecemealed economic development in Illinois for many years. What I mean is you have to look at it holistically. Um, in, the, in the city of Cairo, uh, in uh, Senator Fowler's district, they're do, trying to do a little bit better job of when you're looking at, do we want to have the Cairo Port District? What does that mean? It isn't just bringing people into work. You also have to have housing. You have to have daycare. You have to have good schools. You have to have public safety. People want to you... know when they lay their head down at night, they're safe. Yeah, I think you set. View, yeah, I think you right? set us up for a, a whole separate program uh, on that with that issue because that is a big one, uh, and certainly something we've talked about before. Senator Terry Bryant of Illinois Senate District 58. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. For everyone at WSIU, I'm Fred Martino. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.